The scripture reading for today comes from 1 Samuel chapter 15, verses 34 to 16, 13. Then Samuel left, or left for Ramah, and, but Saul went up to his home in Gilbeth of Saul. Until the day Samuel died, he did not go to see Saul again, though Samuel mourned for him. And God regretted that God made Saul king over Israel. God said to Samuel, How long for, will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears about it, he will kill me. God said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to God, and invite Jesse to sacrifice, and I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one that I indicate. Samuel did what God said. And when he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the sovereign God. Consecrate yourself and come to sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. When they arrived, Samuel saw Elah and thought, surely the God, the God's anointed stands here before God. But God said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. God does not look at things as people do. People look at the outward appearances, but God looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadad and had him pass in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, God has not chosen this one either. Jesse then had Shem Shemaha pass by, but Samuel said, nor has God chosen this one. Jesse had seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, God has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? There is still one, the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So they sent for him and brought him in. He was glowing with health and had a fine appearance and handsome features. Then God said, rise up and anoint him. This is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of God came down powerfully upon David. Samuel then went to Ramah. You got it a blessing to this reading. You may be seated. Oh my goodness gracious, that is an incredible story. I love the story of Samuel uh, call, uh, calling David. You know, the thing, the precursor to this story is that uh, before, before Samuel goes out uh, to anoint David as king, uh, the, the people are saying, we want a king, we want a king, we want a king. And, I mean, why on earth? Why on earth? There's this whole discussion around that. And so, so Samuel decides, you know, I'm going to do what God has called me to do. And so... He listens, and he follows, and he goes, and he goes out, and he uh, goes to where God sends him. I believe there's this, this, this is a ceremonial text. And it's this traditional age of culture that it's understood that the oldest son would receive the inheritance. The oldest son would receive everything, even the anointing. 
the culture, it was that their culture then, and possibly as if you were at discipleship, you heard a little bit about some cultural norms that haven't changed too much, but it was a culture then uh, that the firstborn male was favored. Uh, but I think it's very interesting that by verse 6, there's this enormous surprise when the, the oldest son is rejected. It provides an explanation in 1 Samuel 16, 7 that gives us this nugget that is so important. And it, it, it is, for God does not see as mortals see, or as people see. Because people look on the outside, but God looks at the heart. That to me is a powerful nugget for us. God looks at our heart. God's ways are often confounding to us, but that not need be that shouldn't surprise us, considering how little we know compared to the omniscient God, the all-knowing God. God defies culture and convention and breaks this yoke of expectation and norms and gives Samuel wisdom to know the difference when picking a king. You think there might be a little pressure on Samuel to pick the first one because that's the way we've always done it before? <laughs> I think yes. And then the second one and then the next one and the next one, it's like maybe by that time they were like, okay, oh well. But there might have been some pressure there to do something different. Not to just anoint the oldest son and put him in place. And I think sometimes we get a little bit lazy and, and we just go with the flow. We go with the flow. And we, instead of doing what God wants us to do, maybe God's calling us to step out and make a difference. Maybe God's calling us to be a voice for someone that doesn't have one. Breaking the yoke. And so Samuel knows, at least I think he does, that something is amiss. Something's a little bit off here from the, from the time that um, um, from, the, from the time that he gets the oldest one there to the time that the last one is given comes before. So Samuel is attentive to God. And Samuel knew that the promise was made and that God is faithful, but son after son is rejected. You know, it's like, I don't know if he had, I'm just not feeling it. <laughs> kind of thing. I'm just not feeling it. Or I don't know how he knew, but he knew. He paid attention and he knew there was a promise and he knew that God would select. After all, it wasn't Samuel who selected the king, but it was God. Samuel was the vessel. Samuel was the vessel. And so he asked, don't you have anybody, any other sons? Are this, is this it? And of course, we know the story because I just read it. Oh yes, there's one more, and he's out in the field tending the sheep. He didn't make the journey into town. And so they call for David to come in to town. The, the youngest son, David, wasn't on the radar. He wasn't, he wasn't there. But just as God rejects the expected, God also selects the unexpected. In case you don't know it, 
there's only one you. Even if you have a twin brother or a twin sister, while they share many of the same things, they are not you and you are not them. You are created in God's image to be the you that God created you to be. Sometimes that takes some time to figure out all of that, even the fullness of God, amen? <laughs> I'm still figuring it out. I know for a fact, however, that all of you in this room, all of you were created to be free, to be who you were created to be. That you are special. That you were created to be something special. You created in God's image, and that image is good even if you're the youngest. Are you the youngest? Even if you're the youngest, you can make a difference. Did you know that? You can make a difference, because you're the youngest. Yep. <laughs> I believe that we have a skewed image sometimes of ourselves, and especially before we receive the blessing and the anointing of God. And I read a great quote this week that says, We lie loudest when we lie to ourselves. Ooh. Eric Hoffer said that. We lie loudest when we lie to ourselves. It's important that each one of us learns to search our soul and find out the truth of God's love and what it's meant for us. What it means to us. Searching and doing, living and learning. You are free to be who you are called to be. And you are free to live in the godly anointing of life if you choose to follow it. People choose to say yes to the fullness of God. You have to make that decision. God's not going to just whap you upside the head. That's not how God works. <laughs> But instead, I see people running around, seeking everything else, trying to fill their lives with people, party, and play. And it's those things that linger and try to get in the way. And the thing is, if you attend to God, those things that you desire will fall in line with God's blessing and you will end up like David being promoted. Promoted from the selfishness of life to the abundance of God. From the field of tending sheep to the field of dreams. Be assured, I want you to know this, saints, that God has called you. Whether you think it or not, God has called you. Each and every one of you, God has called you. You are the beloved, you are a special child of God, and you have so much potential just because you have been called out by God. Did you know that your life has a far-reaching uh, potential? If you don't, I want to tell you that your life has far-reaching potential beyond the walls of what you can even imagine. Potential to do something You could have said, I'm busy tending the sheep. He could have said, I can't go right now. But he answered the call. He made the journey. He trekked on in there. And you have the potential to do something special. If you answer the call to live free from the bondages of 
the things that try to hinder you. Some of us carry around our bondage with us in our attitude or, you know, we carry it around and it's time to be free from that. As we see in this passage, God doesn't call people because of their stature, of their good looks, <laughs> of their status, or any other outward reason. God calls people because of who they are, and more importantly, God calls people for who God wants them to be and who God wants them to become. God sees the inward you. And the person, the inward you, has so much potential to become something powerful. The inward you is powerful. Many times people try to be something they're not especially in the olden days when we had, you know, we lived in the closet, amen? <laughs> hey, I don't see our young people living in the closet anymore. Praise God. They're proud. They're out. They're not afraid anymore, as Troy says. But so we used to try to conform to some rule or some standard that did, didn't fit. I wonder how David felt being left out in the field, working all alone, being the youngest. But you see, it didn't matter to God. It didn't matter to God that they thought he was the least, because God didn't. God didn't think he was the least. Maybe when they called David in from the field, he was wondering, what did I do now? <laughs> what now? But the thing is about David, David had spent time with God. He knew God. He had spent time praising God. And that you could see from some of the heartfelt emotions of God. Now, David was no saint. As you, if you read on, you'll see. But see, David poured out his life to God. And if you read the Psalms, you can see it. And you can almost feel this emotion of, of David in the Psalms. As the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longs for you. David knew God. And God knew David. When we figure out that life is to be poured out for God, we can find the benefit of things beyond our own comprehension. If you figure out for your life what is beneficial and what is not, then you can check yourself. But if you're trying to figure that out on your own, you will keep on having the desires of other things instead of the desires of God. You see, God has to be your soul piece. And you have to know God and let God know you. In other words, saints, there's a vulnerability there. And if you can't be vulnerable with God, then goodness sakes, who can you be vulnerable with? And matter of fact, how can you be vulnerable with anybody else if you really haven't been vulnerable with God first? Because if you can't be vulnerable with God first, it's really hard to be vulnerable with somebody else. Because God knows you better than anything or anyone. soul peace. I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you today to be free. To be free from the trappings of the world and let God anoint you. Let God surprise you. And God will. Let God heal you. And God will. 
Let God free you. <coughs> Let God free you. I want to close this morning with this song from Marcia Stevens. It's called Free to Be. And I'm going to read the words because they're so powerful. I was wandering homeless, a minstrel unto God, longing just to sing my precious tunes, a person with no people, cast down but not destroyed. Now with your help, I'm singing through my deepest wounds. Now I'm free to be in the great I am. I'm free to fall and I'm free to stand. No secrets hidden from the Holy Lamb. I'm free to be who I am. Lilies are just lilies. Fledglings grow to birds, both without a struggle or thought, and all my strongest efforts and best self-righteousness can't add an inch of height or make me what I'm not. Someone new, not someone else. Jesus made me, slavery behind me, birthright is mine, and no one can sell me if I'm free. Amen. I'm free to be in the great I am. I'm free to fall and I'm free to stand. No secrets to hide from the Holy Lamb. I'm free to be, I'm free to be who I am. And so are you.